All right, welcome and good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, May 2nd. It is 9.01, and we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. We ask folks who are with us in person, if you're both willing and able to stand for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, today's invocation will be delivered by Pastor Philip Moore of Eden Fellowship Ministries. Uh, Pastor, thank you for joining us. Eternal Father in heaven, we thank you for helping us gather here safely as we discuss another monthly meeting of events to come in our community of Wichita. Please help us to do your work through our elected city officials. Please guide us and keep our intentions honest and allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community. Help us make decisions that are just and fair and that will benefit all those who call this place home. We pray your blessings upon us and upon our work. May we always strive to do what is right and good. And may we seek and may we always seek your will in all that we do. Without your love, we would not be able to experience real true love in our lives. Please help us to spread your love, your word, and your messages throughout our community as you continue to guide us to lead pure and clean lives. In your precious and holy name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Madam Clerk. Approve the minutes of the regular meeting of April 25th, 2023. Does every member had a chance to review the minutes, and if so, is there any discussion? If there's no discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Motion is seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Proclamations, Jewish American Heritage Month. If you're here to receive the proclamation for Jewish American Heritage Month, please make your way to the front. So if you're here to take uh, photos uh, for not just this proclamation, but any of the proclamations, uh, feel free to utilize this space right here. This is your space, your time, uh, so don't, don't feel like you have to zoom in from the back or anything. Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870. Whereas, Jewish immigrants to America, ever since their first arrival to our shores in the 16th century, have played a central role in the creation, growth, freedom, prosperity, and strength of the United States of America. And whereas, Jewish citizens of Wichita, Kansas, having first settled in 1869, played a central role in the great cattle boom between 1860 and 1880. Among them were Sol and Morris Kahn, who helped to recruit the rail railroad and cattle industry to the area. Jewish citizens also contributed by serving in the armed forces of the United States and the Kansas National Guard. And whereas, following the rebirth of Zionism and the mir miraculous return of the Jewish people to the Jewish homeland, the United States was, first, was the first country in the world to recognize the state of Israel in 1948, and over the years has developed a deep friendship and unbreakable alliance with the state of Israel based upon shared values and mutual interests. And whereas... The State of Israel is now celebrating the 75th anniversary of its modern founding and its emergence over the last few decades as a beacon of freedom and prosperity and a world leader in technology, agriculture, water conservation, medicine, and all manner of innovation. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, Mayor of the City of Wichita, Kansas, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim May 2023 as Jewish American Heritage Month in the city of Wichita and encourage all citizens to commemorate this occasion by appropriately celebrating 
the contributions of the Jewish community's history, heritage, and culture. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Whipple and City Council for um, issuing this proclamation. My name is Adam Barron, and thank you for the opportunity to speak for five minutes about Jewish American Heritage Month. And my own experiences as a Jewish American living in, in Wichita, Kansas, I am here representing the Wichita Jewish community, as well as the combat anti-Semitism movement that you're all honorary members of now. In 2006, the U.S. Congress unanimously passed a bipartisan resolution establishing Jewish American Heritage Heritage Month, and it has been celebrated every year since on the national level. President Biden issued an announcement on Friday. That same bill also called on state and local governments to celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month, and I'd like to thank the City Council and Mayor, Rip and Mayor Whipple for issuing the proclamation this morning for the very first time. We hope this will become an annual event here in Wichita and across the country. The Kansas governor and the state legislature each also issued a proclamation a few weeks ago in Topeka for the first time, and now 29 states and over 150 cities will be issuing proclamations this year, and most of these also for the first time. At the time of rising anti-Semitism and other forms of hate in our country and around the world, we especially appreciate and thank the city council for this gesture and also this important proclamation approved last year um, addressing anti-Semitism. The Jewish community is having an event and lunch this Sunday at the Jewish Community Center, and you're all invited. The first Jewish people arrived in what was then called New Amsterdam in the early 1650s to flee persecution from Dutch-controlled Brazil. The second Jewish community was then established in Newport, Rhode Island in 1658. A century later, after America gained its independence, President George Washington visited this Newport Jewish congregation in 1790 to make it clear to the community that Jews who had fled persecution in other countries for centuries would be welcome to live as free citizens in the new country of America. He went on to say in a letter to the congregation that the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. And these words have become the classic expression of America's commitment to religious freedom ever since. In 1883, another century later, a young Jewish woman poet named Emma Lazarus <clears throat> wrote a poem that now appears on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty that includes these words, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. These words are the co cornerstone of the values of our country. In 1918, during World War I, a famous Jewish composer named Irving Berlin wrote what became the most famous American patriotic song, God Bless America. The Jewish people feel safe and are proud to be Americans and have tried to do our best to cont contribute to the fabric of the United States since even before its founding, whether in arts, medicine, law, business, social services, and most every aspect of public life. On a more personal level, my father, Robert Barron, who grew up in Ohio and joined the Army at the age of 18 to fight in World War II. He was a member of the 94th Chemical Mortar Battalion and fought under General Patton's Third Army in Germany. He and my mother, Joan Barron, <clears throat> moved to Wichita in the 1950s to start, to start a family and a family business. My father was president of the Wichita School Board, and in 1970, he was the president that led the city of Wichita through the process of integrating its public schools. He was also president of the Wichita Chamber of Commerce. He's 97 now and lives in Florida. My mother, Joan, was also very involved in the Wichita community. She received her master's in art studies from Wichita State and was very involved in the Ulrich Museum, and was the chairman of the Board of Regents at Wichita State University. She passed away in 2016, and our Jewish Community Center is named in her honor. For me, I was also grateful and proud, I'm also grateful and proud to be an American living in Wichita, Kansas. I was born at Wesley Hospital, went to Cos Harris Elementary School, Coleman Middle School, graduated from Southeast High School a long time ago, where I was president of my high school class and the 6A state champion in tennis. I attended Harvard College where I was, received my BA and became an NCAA All-American in tennis. and was captain of our team. I received an MBA from Northwestern and have been working in our family business here in Wichita for the last 30 years. My wife, Ellen, is now president of our Jewish congregation. We raised our three children here in Wichita. I pray freely to my God at our Jewish congregation each week, travel to Israel three times a year, and I know that I speak for the Jewish people here in Wichita and around the country when I say that I appreciate as a Jewish American that I'm living in the greatest country on earth. 
Thank you again to the Wichita City Council for your efforts this morning and for making Wichita a safe, welcoming, and enjoyable place for all of its people. <clears throat> Madam Clerk. Our Kansas River Trash Cleanup Day. If you're here to receive the proclamation for our Kansas River Trash Cleanup Day, please make your way to the front. Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870. Whereas the celebration of National Earth Day can take many forms, the city of Wichita's premier environmental event takes place along the Arkansas River with dedicated and passionate volunteers from across Cedric County. And whereas the Arkansas River trash cleanup is a 20-year tradition to clean up Wichita's greatest natural water resource. And whereas the 2023 Arkansas River trash cleanup will increase water quality, protect the animals that call the river home, enhance Wichita's image, and safeguard all communities downstream from Derby to the Gulf of Mexico. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, Mayor of the City of Wichita, Kansas, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim May 6, 2023 as Arkansas River Trash Cleanup Day in the city of Wichita and encourage all citizens to celebrate Earth Day by participating in the Arkansas River Trash Cleanup to help make our city a beautiful place to live, work, and play. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. And I won't, I won't take the full five minutes because I don't have a thing prepped. But I do want to say that for the last 20 plus years uh, that volunteers have pulled out more than 36 tons of litter out of the river. And if you want a uh, way to compare that, the keeper of the plains is about five tons. So we've essentially pulled out um, about seven and, and some uh, keeper of the plains worth trash uh, out of the river. We have over 900 folks pre-registered for this year's event. We're very excited. The weather looks great. So please, you're all invited to come out uh, Saturday morning. We'll be next to the Drury Plaza Hotel. Enjoy a great cookout uh, from our lead sponsor at Cargill. Uh, the city of Wichita has always been a big partner um, and leader in this event. Uh, just a little bit of history. When I worked for the city of Wichita, I started this event and used to be able to run it out of the back of my pickup with a couple of boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts. We have grown since then. Uh, so I hope to have you all out and thank our sponsors. We do have a t-shirt for the mayor this year um, because of some sponsorship that we got for our, from Party of the Planet, Party for the Planet through Sedgwick County Zoo. We were able to up our game on t-shirts and they are now all nice and soft organic cotton and recycled materials. So we're putting our money where our mouth is. Thank you.
had to hide this from my wife because she steals all the comfortable t-shirts. So, Madam Clerk. National Foster Care Month. If you're here to receive the proclamation for National, excuse me, National Foster Care Month, please make your way to the front. Proclamation of the City of Wichita, Kansas, founded in 1870, whereas the month of May was first designated as Foster Care Awareness Month in 1988 by President Ronald Reagan as a time to recognize foster parents that opened their homes to foster youth, and whereas in the United States, over 407,000 children and youth are in foster care, and 34% uh, were placed with relatives or kin. Over 100,000 of these children need adoptive families, and 7,000 of those children reside in the state of Kansas. And whereas, national data shows that black and Native American children continue to be overrepresented among those entering foster care. Black children represent 20% of those entering care by only 14% of the total child population, while Native American kids make up 2% of the entering care and 1% of the child population. And whereas, more than 20,000 young people in the United States age out of the foster care system. This means they turn 18 years old and no longer are no longer eligible for foster care benefits. As a result, many of these young adults are left to fend for themselves. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Brandon Whipple, Mayor of the City of Wichita, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2023 as National Foster Care Month in the City of Wichita and encourage all citizens to participate in this observation. Good morning. My name is Jean Williams. My maiden name was Ware. My niece, Alexandria Ware, who started a Culture Creations is a nonprofit organization to do just that and help foster children that have aged out because she did. Um, I was taken away from my mother in 1960 from here where I was born in Wichita. And this loop of life, as my niece says, is I'm back here to receive this for Alexandria. I had no idea that this is what she was gonna ask me to do today, so I am totally surprised, but that's the loop of life. And here I am to thank you, Mayor Whipple, City Council, for honoring us with this, because now we can continue on with what our dreams have been, is to help others that age out of foster care, be successful citizens of different communities, and especially Wichita, which I was born in, and is my home and have returned. Have a great day. Good. Madam Clerk. Certificate of recognition. Is SB mowing here? Come on up. All right, y'all, I, I got to keep it together. I'm actually a big fan. Um, <laughs> so this, this young man is, is a bit of a internet influencer, I guess we could call it, but it's a little more than that. Uh, basically, uh, this is someone who has uh, made national uh, or received national recognition for utilizing his skills uh, as, a, uh, as someone who owns a lawn care business to help folks who, frankly, either themselves can't go mow their lawn or uh, they, uh, they, they might not have the resources to, get to uh, mow their lawn and to uh, really beautify their, their own, uh, help beautify their neighborhood. Uh, so I follow you on, on, and I hate to admit this, I follow you on uh, TikTok. And it's interesting because he'll actually just go up to people's homes and just say, hey, I see that your yard uh, needs to, to pretty much be straightened out or that you need some edging. And in this society, and really the moment we're at, and, and sadly, uh, as a community, is nine times out of 10 when someone's knocking on your door to talk about your yard, it's usually negative. 
Uh, you almost prepare yourself to be defensive on, you know, or, or to talk about why, you know, you, you had stuff that, that got in the way or you weren't able to straighten up the yard. And what this person does is he actually spins the conversation by saying, I'll do it for you for free. Uh, and he does this. And it's just a, so it, it's so Wichita, to be honest, to be looking out for our neighbors. Uh, and it's also just uh, uh, inspiring because, again, uh, it, it shows that uh, looking out for one another is uh, really brings joy and improvements to our community. So uh, we, <laughs> when we found out that you were a Wichita, uh, we reached out and wanted to honor you uh, with a certificate of appreciation to SB Mowing uh, for its dedication to the residents of Wichita, Kansas. SB Mowing embodies the values of Wichita by improving our community and providing services to our neighbors that need a little extra help. And again, it's just, my job as mayor of Wichita is to brag about um, the community we have, the people we have, and you just made my job a lot easier uh, because you are the embodiment, really, of our culture here to look out for one another. And this is just a small token of our appreciation, not just for the work that you do, uh, but really uh, for inspiring others to step up, step out, and to help others as well. Thank you to Mayor Whipple and the City Council for recognizing me. This is pretty cool. I get really nervous just talking in front of you guys, but um, millions of people see my videos, and that does make me nervous. But uh, I've, uh, I've been mowing lawns in the Wichita area for 12 years. I started when I was in sixth grade, and just a year and a half ago, I just saw some people doing it on social media, just doing it for free for people. And so I just decided to go out and try it. And here, a year and a half later, I've I've done a little over 70 yards, and most of them in the Wichita area. My wife and I traveled to um, Florida and Texas this winter uh, to help people in those areas since grass wasn't growing around here. And um, I've, we've done pressure washing as well. And after a year and a half, I just put all of our analytics together yesterday. We've got 1.4 billion views on social media and a little over 12 and a half million followers. So it's absolutely crazy. I wanted to thank my wife. She helps me out a ton. She's a big supporter of mine. She edits a lot of videos for me now. And I wanted to thank my family and my friends and all my supporters and subscribers on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, just all the social media platforms. And thank you for the mayor and the city council for recognizing me. I appreciate it. Madam Clerk. Sybil Strom, Central came in without permission. All right, we're rolling into the public agenda part of the meeting. Uh, welcome to Ms. Uh, Strom. We're glad you're here. My name is Sybil Strom. I reside at 326 North Walnut. The Central inspection came into my old house without permission. They illegally came in I made a police, a police report about it. I told, I told Dave Unruh about it, the Sutton County Commissioner. He said, go call the police. I am outraged that my house was targeted. There are houses in my neighborhood that are worse. There's a house 220 North Walnut that has junk on the porch, the grass hasn't been done, and nobody has done nothing to them. And then 303 North Walnut got remodeled, and there was a felon in the house before. We were on lockdown March 2nd, 2023. Why does the Central target me? They target me Everywhere I go, I've actually wanted to move out of Wichita, Kansas, because of this. 
It hurt me emotionally, it hurt me mentally, and it hurt me physically. My stuff was stolen by the Central. I was told that I had to live with it. No, nobody has the right to, to live with that. It was a legal entering. I have now filed charges on it with the police department. And also, I know my minute's almost up. Also, I have been a pillow of this community. I've taught schools, elementary schools, junior highs, high school. I worked for the election board, 1984 to 2007. I asked for help, but nobody helped me except Brandon Johnson, First District City Council, Maggie Ballard, my district. But Vincent Hancock and Chris Pellucci knew about it. They said, why are you going on her property? She's not even here. So, and then what made it worse, and Evergy dumped the tree limbs in my yard and semi-tires and I never got to pick my contractor. And I never got to pick anything. And I think you homeowners would like to pick your own contractors. But I was told, nope, you're not gonna get your way. I am outraged. I want retaliation. I want money. From I wanna know who the central was that did this to me. And they won't let me know. I am just so tired of this hassles. I'm, a, I'm good to the community. I've never committed a crime. I've been there for the schools, like I said. I've been there. My house was a place where alcoholic families that couldn't take care of the kids would come to my house. Drug addicts. Parents could not handle their kids, so I would handle them. I just was a place to go. I was called the pizza, the cookie, Kool-Aid person. And I do expect to get, the reason I come to your podium again is because I want answers. I want answers. Why did they target me? Thank you. Thank you. No answers again. Madam Clerk. Consent agenda items one through 14. All right, rolling into consent agenda items one through 14. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. I'd like to pull item number four and item number eight. Items number four and eight will be pulled from the consent agenda and discussed following the consent agenda. Uh, Councilmember Fry. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to pull number 12. Number, item number 12 would be pulled and discussed uh, independently uh, after four and eight. Is there any further discussion on the consent agenda? If there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept the consent agenda as presented with the exceptions of item four, eight, and 12. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. I've received 78 votes. That motion does pass. The chair recognizes Councilmember Johnson uh, for a discussion on item four. Thank you, Mayor. Due to a personal conflict, I have to abstain from this vote. Let the record reflect that Councilmember Johnson is abstaining uh, from voting on item number four. Is there further discussion on item number four? If there is no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action from item number four of the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open the roll. Members will cast their vote. Having received six yay votes to one abstention, uh, that motion does pass. Chair <coughs> recognizes Councilmember Johnson for discussion on item number eight of the consent agenda. Thanks, Mayor. Due to a personal conflict, I have to abstain from this vote. Let the record show that Councilmember Johnson will be abstaining from item number eight on the consent agenda. Is there further discussion on item number eight? 
If there's no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept SAS recommended action to approve the transfer and real estate agreement and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. I've received six yay votes to one abstention. Uh, that motion does pass. The chair recognizes Council Member Fry for discussion on item number 12. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask staff to come up to help quickly answer a couple of questions regarding this. Um, this has to do with the request for a street name change. Uh, in my eight years on the council, this is the first request that I've had um, requesting a, a street name change. And so knowing that, I wanted to make sure that um, we had a fair and deliberate process that was conducted to ensure that everyone affected was treated the same. So maybe uh, staff could just kind of walk us through how we went about this um, Decision. Morning. Right. Morning, I shall try. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mayor, Council Members, J.R. Cox, Metropolitan Area Planning Department, for the record. So the, the process is really relatively simple. There are about four steps. Um, there's a Wichita Sedgwick County Street Naming um, Committee that reviews any request for street name changes. If it is recommended that the street name be changed, an application is filed with the Metropolitan Area Planning Department. At that time, MAPD notifies affected residents, uh, schedules a subdivision committee meeting, hearing, and also prepares a staff report. Um, after the subdivision committee hears the case, it then is forwarded to the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, assuming that they approve the requested name change, an ordinance is prepared and is forwarded to city council for your approval. So that is the, the fairly simple process. Okay, so um, again, this isn't something that we go into lightly. Name changes don't happen very often. Uh, this was brought to my attention last November, and now we're into May, so it took about seven months. Um, quite a bit of oversight and opportunity for people to weigh in and review. Um, I you went through all the different departments. Um, I know the Diversity and Inclusion and Civil Rights Board looked at it. My district advisor, advisory board heard it last night. Uh, personally, I also reached out to the Mid-America All-Indian Museum and the Native American Indian Youth Education Program at USD 259. And so every step of the way, the consensus was the same, that it was time to change the name because the word itself narrows the connotation to all women of Native American heritage. And so obviously I know this is going to be an inconvenience for the residents on that particular street, but I, I've also got assurances from the staff that they will take care of notifying the utilities as well as the post office. The residents will have to take care of their personal items, but it's temporary. And whereas a street name should be lasting and something that should be inviting to all residents of Wichita. Uh, so today's action would be the final step in the process by the council. And um, I don't know if there's any discussion. If not, I'm happy to make a motion. See no discussion, the only Discussion I would offer is to thank you for taking this on. Uh, it's very, uh, I think, important. And of course, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, change is stressful. And I'm, yeah. although I'm not aware of uh, really, or wasn't involved in a lot of the discussion, I assume um, it, it was rigorous. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the uh, council members' efforts uh, to ensure that we create a Wichita for all, uh, including um, those who, who uh, th th those who perhaps weren't thought of when this road was named. Uh, so with that, I, I defer the floor to Council Member uh, Fry uh, for a motion. Thank you. Uh, with that, I make the motion that the City Council approve the street name change request, place the ordinance on first reading, authorize the necessary signatures, and instruct the City Clerk to publish the ordinance after approval on second reading. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Madam Clerk. Board of Bids and Contracts and Wichita Airport Authority Board of Bids and Contracts dated May 1st, 2023. Good morning, sir, and welcome. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, Josh Lauber, Department of Finance. Uh, for the May 1st, Board of Bids recommendations are as follows. 
For engineering, we have the Northeast Riverside Water Main Replacement Phase 2 for McCullough Excavation Incorporated in the amount of $1,592,973. We have the Bridge Repair Stormwater Sewer Number 780 on Eisenhower Airport Parkway for Wildcat Construction Company Incorporated for an aggregate bid total of $199,337. We have the Stryker Sports Phase 9A Field Netting Installation for Multicon Incorporated in the amount of $69,016.75. For purchasing, we have the bus stop shelters, uh, rejecting all bids. We have the drainage way mowing for Commercial Lawn Management Incorporated at $97 per acre. We have the Toro Riding Flex Wing Mowers for professional turf products in the amount of $185,836.68. And for airport, we have the Airport Jabara Snow Removal Equipment Building Construction uh, deferring to May 22nd, 2023. This is how to become a vendor with the City of Wichita. These are our current open requests for proposals out on the street. <coughs> And I would recommend to approve the bid words as recommended and stand for questions. Questions for staff. See none, input from the public on this item. See none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. If there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to receive and file the report, approve the contracts, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. Clerk will open a roll, members cast the vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does indeed pass. Madam Clerk. Public hearing and request for a letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds, Aspen Iron Horse Industrial to LLC. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Tim Goodpasture with the Development Services Department of the City Manager's Office. The request for you today is a request for a letter of intent for the issuance of industrial revenue bonds for Aspen Iron Horse Industrial to LLC. Aspen Iron Horse II LLC is a recently created limited liability corporation created for the last development, uh, for the development of the last lot remaining at Iron Horse Industrial Park in southwest Wichita. Uh, Aspen Funds, which created Aspen Iron Horse Industrial II LLC, is a private real estate investment firm based in Overland Park, Kansas, which manages over $100 million in investor capital and has invested in all 50 states. The land for Iron Horse uh, Industrial is located at the southwest corner of MacArthur and Seneca. Uh, Aspen Iron Horse is requesting a letter of intent to issue industrial revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $16.5 million for the construction of a 151,000 151, square foot speculative industrial building. The bonds will be acquired by Aspen or a related entity. Uh, the area outlined in red is where the Iron Horse Industrial Park is located. You can see Seneca Street on the right side of the aerial running top to bottom and MacArthur Road running from left to right along the top of the aerial. The area outlined in blue is where the new speculative industrial building will be constructed. In December of 2017, the City Council approved the speculative industrial program which requires developers to build a minimum of 100,000 square feet with a minimum of 28 foot clear height uh, with tilt up concrete being the preferred construction material. The developer must start construction within 120 days of council approval and complete construction within 15 months of city council approval. Uh, the developer must issue industrial revenue bonds to achieve a 95% abatement for the first five years and a 50% abatement for the second five years if the property is at least 50% leased at the five-year mark. There is no property tax abatement for the land. Uh, the property to be abated does not exist today, so it will generate new property taxes after the tax abatement period. So far, 11 projects have been approved under the current City Council policy, which uh, equates to a total of investment in excess of $128 million. Seven projects have been fully completed and leased, Four are under construction, and I put initially one was leased. Actually, two are now leased. Uh, one was announced last week uh, uh, as being leased to CNH Industrial. So two of the four that are under construction are leased. 
uh, Webb Industrial at 40th Street North and Tobin uh, was recently completed and is available. ICT 21 has had three buildings constructed between 180,000 square feet and 200,000 square feet. Uh, one is complete and two of those are leased. And then Aspen Iron Horse has been approved uh, last October for a letter of intent and is currently constructing a 200,000 square foot facility. All have indicated that there is strong leasing activity. The estimated value of a 95% one year property tax abatement is approximately 450,000 with the city's share being approximately 128,000. The estimated value of a sales tax exemption for this project is approximately 310,000 with the city's share being approximately 85,000. A cost-benefit analysis was conducted by the Center for Economic Development and Business Research at Wichita State University, which shows an overall ratio of benefits to costs to the city of 1.35 to 1, 1.33 to 1 for the city's general fund, and 1.40 to 1 for the city's debt service fund. Therefore, it is staff's recommendation that the city council close the public hearing, adopt the resolution of intent, and authorize the necessary signatures. Dan Schulte, who is a partner in Aspen Funds, and Mark Sprecher, who is an attorney representing Aspen Funds, are available online to answer any questions that you may have, and I would be happy to stand for any questions as well. Questions for staff. Councilmember Bluebaugh. Jim, how many... Um Square foot of buildings do we have over there at Iron Horse now? Do you know? So we have uh, three buildings that have been constructed. Uh, one is under construction. Aspen Funds is building a 200,000 square foot spec industrial building. And then this will be the final building to complete the Iron Horse industrial complex. Yeah, do, you know, do you know how many square foot of buildings they have total with the hyperpet and everything the, else? Yeah, the three that are existing are each just over 100,000 square feet. So there's 300,000 square feet uh, of existing facilities. And then again, the 200,000 square feet that Aspen is constructing now. And then this 151,000 will be the final one in that, in that development. Okay. Further questions for staff? Around 650 then? My yeah. Questions. It was projected to be 600 originally uh, when they started that. So, yes, yeah, 650 is where we're at today. Councilman Breyer, I apologize for interrupting you. Tim, would you be so kind to give us just a brief overview of the spec warehouse program in general? This is due to some changes we made recently or somewhat recently to our uh, economic development uh, policy. And I would love just to get a, a bit of an update on uh, from uh, the, the our economic development folks about a, your reflection on how this program has been going. Absolutely. We had a uh, temporary spec industrial policy in 2012, mid-2012, that sunsetted in 2014 that was a little bit similar to what we have today. It sunsetted and developers were approaching us saying, hey, you know, we have this land, we'd love to build some large uh, speculative industrial buildings, but to spend 10 or 12 or $15 million is a big hurdle to overcome. If we knew we at least had a tax abatement that we could provide and a sales tax exemption, we might go ahead and continue to build additional buildings. And so we met with a number of developers and kind of recrafted what the speculative industrial program could look like in terms of what the Greater Wichita Partnership was hearing from site selectors in terms of required building sizes for clients of theirs, uh, clear height in terms of what their clients were looking for. And between what we were hearing from site selectors for the Greater Wichita Partnership and developers that we were talking to in the community came up with what is the current policy that was approved. Uh, again, I believe that was in 2017. And that was requiring this minimum of 100,000 square feet that they cannot divide it smaller than 25,000 square feet. The intent being that we want to see large uh, industrial space that's available. Wichita has been in a unique situation in that we do not have large vacant industrial spaces, which is a good thing that we don't have large buildings that are vacant. It's a bad thing in that we have site selectors who would kind of pass over Wichita because we didn't have these large vacant buildings. Uh, it is interesting in that we require a minimum of 100,000 square feet 
Most of the buildings we're seeing that the that are being built under this policy today are 140, 150, 180, 200,000 square feet. So they're building much larger than what we have been requiring them to build. Uh, we actually had a 140,000 square foot building that Amazon took in Wichita uh, because it was nearing finishing at the time at which Amazon was looking for a facility. Uh, JTM Foods out of Erie, Pennsylvania took a 200,000 square foot building that was at the permitting stage at the time at which they were looking at Wichita in addition to four other states for a facility. And because that building was already designed and at the permitting stage, it worked well for their timing. Uh, JTM will take uh, occupancy of that building at ICT 21 uh, uh, before September 1st of this year. So this has been a very successful program in terms of, of incur encouraging developers to build these buildings and having them available uh, for companies that are actively looking for something that will be available either today or shortly thereafter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions for staff? See none, thank you. Is there improvement to public on this item? See none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench. For the discussion on this item? If there's no further discussion, then I will defer the floor to Councilmember Bluebaugh as this item resides in District 4. Thank you very much, Mayor. And, and I'm very excited about this. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago. We were just talking about the Iron Horse um, Industrial Park. We were talking about what we could, could do with the SPEC program. So um, it, it, it's great seeing how it's all came together. So I'd like to take the opportunity to close the public hearing adopt the resolution of intent and authorize the necessary signatures. Also want to put a shout out to Aspen and thank them for investing in Wichita and continuing the um, development of the Iron Horse development or the Iron Horse um, development. So a motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast their vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Northwest Water Treatment Plant Lab Equipment. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, um, Wichita City Council. For the record, Don Henry, Public Works and Utilities. The item before you at the moment um, would approve the budget to purchase uh, equipment and uh, supplies for the new Northwest Water Treatment Facility Laboratory. The new lab, just like the uh, current lab at the existing plant, um, is required to be certified by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. It will remain under the KDHE jurisdiction. Analyses are necessary to ensure that the finished water meets uh, federal drinking water standards, also to uh, furnish data to KDHE on our daily monitoring reports, as well as making sure that we're meeting the city's uh, quality standards for taste and odor. Um, the, uh, it's necessary to, to move forward at this time and, and purchase the uh, instruments, equipment, and supplies because of the lengthy certification process. Uh, we need to have this equipment um, procured by September of this year so we can go through the setup, the calibration, and then um, the uh, certification process itself. Um, note here that uh, this, this was excluded from the uh, design-build contract of the Northwest Water Facility in order to allow staff the flexibility to determine what the uh, best suitable equipment would be for the new lab. The uh, adopted 2023 through 2032 capital improvement program includes funding in the amount of $800,000 um, for lab equipment. It is recommended, oh, it should include that this has been included in the cost of service analysis will not impact rates. Therefore, it's recommended that the city council approve the budget in the amount of $800,000 adopt the resolution and authorize the necessary signatures. I'll stand for any questions that you have. Questions for staff? See none, thank you. Imperfect public on this item? My name is Sybil Strum. I reside at 326 North Walnut. I want to know if the customers are going to have to pay for this. I've noticed that all the utility people have hiked up our utilities. And also I'd like to state that the water tastes bad. That's why some of the customers are going to Colligan. I don't go to Colligan, 
But I would like to know why our water system tastes bad and sometimes it smells bad. Like I said, I want to know if the customers are going to have to pay for this issue. Thank you. What's your call? Um, Don, can you talk about the importance of having a lab for those who aren't quite sure why we would need this as we modernize our water facility? Yes, absolutely. And um, the laboratory is necessary in order to meet clean drinking water standards, um, not only for the aesthetic purposes that Ms. Drum mentioned, um, taste and odor, but, but also um, for the safety and health of the community. So it, 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 it's necessary, it, it's mandatory. And, and also um, the point of will customers you know, have to pay for this improvement. Um, this improvement, like other utility items, is included in the current pro forma and the rate model. So it is rate revenue that pays for these, but it's already been accounted for and will have no further impact on rates. Thank you. Councilmember Fry. Thank you. I'd just like to also remind the community that we're in the building phase of the new water treatment facility. And tomorrow we have a celebration. We reach a milestone. Uh, we've passed the halfway mark. We've reached over a million man labor, labor hours. Um, all things indicate it's proceeding very well. Um, and, and I think we should look forward to a day when our water will taste better. Um, I can't help but notice that in 2009, the city of Wichita won the American Water Works Association Award for best tasting water in the state. So I'm hopeful that we can have an aspirational goal that when our new treatment plant opens up, we'll win that award in 24. So um, I think there are good signs ahead. I didn't know it, there was a municipal water tasting contest, but I appreciate that information. I guess we'll, in America, we'll compete against anything, I guess. <laughs> Further uh, input from the public on this item? See none. Uh, Don, thank you for, for all your work. We got a few other items, so I'm sure you're going to be getting your steps in today uh, as we celebrate Water <laughs> Week meeting. Uh, if there's no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the budget, adopt the resolution, and authorize necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Which has been seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Having received 78 votes, that motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Raw water supply pipeline connection rehabilitation. All right, moving down to the next item about uh, construction of our new water plant. For the record, Don Henry, Public Works and Utilities. I will eventually excuse myself from the podium, but you're stuck with me for the next two items. <laughs> the uh, item in front of you at the moment, um, it would approve the budget for um, needed improvements to the city's two large water transmission mains. As council is aware, uh, the city receives its drinking water from two primary sources, from Cheney Reservoir and from the Eccles Beds well field. Um, each of these sources has its own large transmission main. And when each of the mains were constructed, um, a number of access points were also installed on the mains. This, this allows for access to the internal workings of the pipe for inspections for needed work, and also to provide additional connection points should they be needed in the future. Uh, they've been in place since the 1960s when the, when the lines were constructed. And in 2016, there was a leak on the Equus line. And um, upon excavation and um, repair of the leak, it was found to be a faulty access point. Each of these includes hardware, steel plates, nuts, bolts. They're susceptible to corrosion and can cause leaks. Um, since that time, uh, two additional sites or two additional access points have been excavated and inspected and found to be in similar condition. And so it's prudent to move forward at this time and um, rehab these access points to head off future leaks. Um, in total, between the two lines, there are 80 access points and uh, this project would provide funding um, to work with adjacent property owners on construction access. Keep in mind that um, these, these locations, besides being in rural areas around um, agricultural areas, also um, run through town to the existing water treatment plant. Uh, these two transmission mains will also remain in service um, once the new water treatment plant comes online. But um, work will include working with owners, um, working around various conflicts, excavating, inspecting, and then replacing um, faulty hardware and other needed repairs. 
The 2022 through 2031 capital improvement program includes funding in the amount of $1 million in 2022 and $1 million in 2023. This is found under the uh, line item water supply rehab projects. At this time, staff requests um, funds in the amount of $1 million for year 2022 and $500,000 from 2023 for a um, total budget request of $1.5 million. It's recommended at this time that City Council approve the budget, adopt the resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Thank you. Questions for staff. Uh, Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for the presentation, Don. Are we going to replace all 80 access points? Yeah, yes, sir. That, that's, that's what we're anticipating. I, I would be surprised if we found any that were still in, in good enough condition that they didn't need some kind of attention. Okay. If they are, if they're okay right now, are we planning on still replacing them? If they look all right, I would I would assume so. Okay, yes, okay, yeah. just stay. All right, thanks, Don. Don, when was the last time these were replaced? Pardon me. When was the last time we these were were replaced? These are the original um, appurtenances, and so they have not been replaced. Um, there were there were three of them. The the one that we had the leak in 2016, so that was replaced. And then the two others that we inspected, those were replaced. So that would leave 77 that have not been replaced. But I, I guess uh, just to put this into context uh, about how often we have to do this, uh, and your, how, how, how often do we normally have to make these replacements? It's a significant investment, but it's also a long-term investment. So I would, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when was the last time council did something like replacing the, these uh, Besides the ones that broke, right? Well, recent recently on on the raw water mains, we've done other work uh, for air release valves, and so there are other appurtenances through time that have, have been replaced. Um, as as far as these um, connection points, um, they are long term assets, and so I would expect with the installation of the new points that they would be good for another fifty to seventy five years. Thank you. Further questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Is there input from the public on this item? See none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. If there is no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the budget, adopt the resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members will cast their vote. Having received 78 votes, that motion does pass. Adam Clerk. Stormwater utility pump station improvements. Welcome. For the record, Don Henry, Public Works and Utilities. Uh, the item before you at the moment would approve the budget um, to be, uh, make improvements at uh, the stormwater utility pump stations. Um, pump stations uh, function to pump away large volumes of uh, stormwater runoff quickly where storm sewers alone will not do the job. Um, and all stormwater management takes care of 15 pump stations. Eight of these stations are associated with the uh, MS Mitch Mitchell um, flood control project, and that, that expense is shared 50-50 by the city and county. Um, seven pump stations serve the city's uh, stormwater utility separate from the flood control project. Um, the project today involves those uh, stormwater utility pump stations, and um, the, uh, the flood control pump stations will be handled in a, in a, in a future item. Uh, planned improvements are prioritized based upon inspections and assessments that are done by staff, and work is prioritized based upon remaining asset life and condition. Uh, the chart in front of you here uh, simply summarizes the details that were included in the uh, agenda report. It provides the location of each pump station, a brief description of the work, and the estimated cost in the far right-hand column for a total amount of $250,000. Generally, work will include, include building upgrades to um, ensure secure entry, new doors, new locks, um, lighting upgrades to LED. Um, electrical equipment will be replaced, uh, such as um, a new generator switch, air handling and heating will be upgraded, and then it will also include con um, concrete repairs and a new concrete pad and fencing for one of the uh, backup generators. The capital improvement program, the, the, the current approved capital improvement program includes $250,000 in funding in the 2023 stormwater utility pump station improvement line item. 
Um, this cost has been accounted for in the, uh, the rate model for stormwater utility and will not impact rates. Uh, therefore, staff recommends that the city council approve the budget in the amount of $250,000, adopt the resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Thank you. Questions for staff? See none. Input from the public on this item? See. If you're, make your way up. Come on. Welcome back. My name is Sybil Strom. I reside at 326 North Walnut. I'm still asking, are the customers going to have to pay for this? I want an answer, and I'm sure all the other customers want to know. Thank you. Councilmember Tuttle. Thank you. I was just going to ask Don if you'd come to the bench and explain to the constituent and then also to the community that there won't be any rate increases or nothing will be impacted by this. Right. Thank you. There, there will be no, no increases on stormwater rates um, for this item. Uh, revenue for these types of improvements um, are paid for by the customers. On each individual's water bill, there is, a, there is a fee for stormwater. And so based upon the amount of impervious surface that you have on your property, um, there, there's, there's a, a fee for that, and then also there's a base rate fee of $1.50 a month. So that's where the revenue comes from. And, and keep in mind, um, should this work not be completed, um, it, would, it would risk the functionality of pump stations. And so um, although we experience street flooding across the city in many areas, uh, we also have um, mapped a 100-year floodplain where, where folks have to have flood insurance. And if one of these pump stations were to fail, um, it could cause homes to flood, businesses to flood. Um, streets could be impassable for emergency vehicles. So th this really is critical work that's needed for and fully funded by the current rate model. Further input from the public on this item? See none. Uh, with that, I will make the motion to accept SAS recommended action to approve the budget, adopt the resolution, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members cast the vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Tourism Business Improvement District 2024 Scope of Services. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Mayor Council. Lindsay Banaka with Arts and Cultural Services out of the City Manager's Budget. Uh, this agenda item is the Tourism Business Improvement District Scope of Services and Budget, also known as TBID. A little bit of background on, on the TBID. Visit Wichita receives annual funding from the City of Wichita for the promotion of tourism and convention activities. Uh, the TBID was formed in 2014 to provide additional funding to promote tourism. Uh, and it's important to know that the district's boundaries itself are the legal limits of the city. Um, and in accordance with the Kansas Business Improvement District statute, the proposed uh, scope of services and budget are presented annually to City Council uh, for approval. Uh, funding previously had experienced limited growth in recent years, uh, while competition for tourism and conventions has intensified. Hence, we, we established the TBID. The scope of services for 2024, um, looking uh, forward to next year, um, are included in today's packet. Uh, specifically, the scope of services outlines uh, how the, the funds received from the 2.75% nightly hotel assessment are used to promote tourism uh, in Wichita, Wichita for the next fiscal year. And Visit Wichita is helping lead the local marketing efforts uh, critical to maintaining and growing Wichita's travel industry and providing dollars back to the local economy. This is a five-year history or kind of recap of the TBID fund itself. Uh, you can note that in 2022, uh, we, we saw um, that the fund not only uh, rebounded from pre-pandemic levels, but is showing uh, signs of growth. The proposed 2024 budget uh, is, is outlined here and uh, is detailed in your packet, uh, but essentially it's $3.65 million uh, with the bulk of it going to leisure marketing expenses. Uh, and then the strategy and budget adjustments um, per the fund as it fluctuates throughout the year uh, will be made, um, will adjust the, the, the allocation uh, if the collections are less than anticipated. Uh, the budget will just be adjusted accordingly. So we don't spend, or Visit Wichita doesn't spend what doesn't come in. 
There are carryover funds indicated in the budget proposal, including at $948,737. Uh, the bulk of that uh, carryover fund is recommended to go towards leisure campaigning. And the TBID board reviewed and approved the use of the carryover funds uh, and the entire scope of services during its second February uh, 2023 meeting. And the recommendation from staff is to receive, approve, and file the Tourism Business Improvement District, or the TBID, uh, 2024 uh, scope of services and budget, excuse me. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Susie Sando, who's the President and CEO of Visit Wichita, and I know there's are additional Visit Wichita staff available uh, to answer questions after uh, that presentation. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. First, I apologize. Uh, recovering from sinus surgery, so uh, forgive the way I'm looking this morning. Um, we admire your perseverance. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for that overview. I thought I would talk just a couple about a couple of things this morning. Uh, the first thing I wanted to chat about was the carryover funds because I'm always asked about those. When we budget, uh, when we budgeted for this past year. The recovery, the good news, the recovery came swifter than we anticipated, so there were those carryover funds. And specifically, the lion's share was spent on the leisure marketing, which is why TBID exists. And we're really excited that with this incremental dollars, we will be out this summer with an extensive campaign promoting the Sunflower Summer Program. So those of you that know that allows um, K through 12 to get in free. We have 15 attractions participating in Wichita. So we will be promoting that throughout the state and we know that's gonna be really beneficial uh, for our attractions. In addition, we have added three new markets that we're testing this year. So if you're in Springfield or uh, Omaha or Lincoln for the first time ever, you're going to now see messaging about coming to Wichita. We've seen Omaha here in Wichita, it's about time we're there. And those funds allowed us to do that as well. Um, and uh, increase our holiday marketing. So we know there's some talk of a new holiday event coming um, this year out at the stadium. We'll be out there extensively marketing that as well. So just wanted to give an overview of that. As we continue the conversation about uh, potentially a new convention center, and I think as we look forward, when we have favorability, I think there's opportunities to look at to see, you know, how do we potentially use those to offset incremental costs, et cetera. Um, but again, this was what the advisory council for this summer voted on for us to use those funds. So I thought I would spend a couple of moments, you know, I talk a lot about leisure and these are the three markets that we go after, leisure, sports, meetings, and conventions. The leisure, you know, we're out there advertising year round and that's um, really compelling. But I wanna chat a little bit about how we go after sports, meetings, and conventions. And let's see here, okay. First thing I wanted to show you is um, this incredible booth. We are really proud of this booth. Uh, this booth is actually, we created in-house last year, and this was out at a convention that we attend. This was in the Detroit uh, Convention Center. You know what I love about this picture? If you look off to the left, you see that little town, Visit Orlando. I love it over there, you know? It's, it positions us uh, really well. So when we're looking at sports and meetings and conventions to bring to Wichita, you gotta figure out who they are. And we tend a lot of trade shows, appointment-based trade shows like this, where our team, at this particular potential com at this conference, we had over 80 one-on-one -on -one appointments with right holders and um, meeting and convention planners. And so they see us; they know we're interested in bringing them here, and it's a way we start building our pipeline. Many of the folks that we meet with are already deep in our pipeline, and we're already potentially working on an event for them to come. Others are brand new, so we have to find that piece of business. So once we find the piece of business, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a. a soccer event that we went at this past year. So what will happen is in the soccer event, one of our managers found an event that um, had never been on our radar, had never been to Wichita before. You start doing all that research. Once you do the research, you hope that maybe they're getting ready to plan in the upcoming years and you look for the RFP. We get the RFP. Once we get the RFP, we put together a package that shows why Wichita would be the perfect place for them to host. And I want to show you, let me go into Here we go. So what you're looking at now is what we call our bid book. 
so we've got the RFP, and now we put together, how can we sell Wichita in a compelling way? This is all customizable. So we, this could be anywhere from 10 to 50 pages, depending. So as you go through, we always start out with our manager, the table of contents, so the meeting planner or the bid rights holder can go to any one of these sections. And these are all important to them because they've asked us in the RFP for all of this information. We move on down. We always start with a letter that will come from our manager to talk about what we're including in this package. And then we get into why Wichita. And we talk about all the incredible things that people are saying about us, why we'd be the perfect spot. And again, not only are we responding to their RFP, but this is actually our, our you know, opportunity to sell them on Wichita. So we want compelling visuals, all customizable. We always have a video in here. It could be our commercial, or it could be another, a lot of times we'll do a, um, something customized just for that piece of business. Of course, we introduce them to the staff. And now we get into the specifics of what they're wanting. For example, on this one, um, we'll go out to all of our hoteliers and find out availability, rates, all that good stuff. We put it right here. We are one-stop shopping, and that's what makes us so unique. Imagine if you're planning an event and you need to use 20 hotels and four or five different off-sites. We are one-stop. You come to visit Wichita, and now we help it. We bring it all back to you in a nice proposal, and then the meeting planner gets to choose how they're going to put this together. So we have all the information on the hotels. All the documents that the hotels provided are attached. And then we get in to show a little bit more about each property. And this is just an example. For example, the ambassador. We'll show a beautiful picture. We'll talk about the property. The meeting room layout. They have lots of meeting space requirements. And we do this for each one of our hotels. The Drury, giving some examples. Century 2, if this is a piece of business that is interested in, in using Century 2, we have Century 2 included, all the wonderful information, meeting space, halls, Mary Jane Till Theater, etc. Another example, Stryker Field, so we do it for sports or groups. All the facility, everything they needed to know right here. And the letters of support are so important, and I want to thank the mayor and council members because we'll always come back and get a letter of support from the city. And then there's a letter of support from me as well. And if it's an event or it's in a group, let's say it's an aviation, then we would go to our, our um, aviation companies to get letters of support, really to show the community support behind it. And again, the meeting planners and events, right, this is really important to them. Of course, we show why Wichita would be great for their event, centrally located right here, how easy transportation is to get here. All the options. Q line is always very popular, so we talk about Q line. And then we get into our convention services. And this is that one stop shopping. Our Midwest hospitality. When they come to visit Wichita, it may be everything from uh, working at the registration booth to organizing uh, the mayor to do a welcome speech to visitor guides uh, to financial contribution. Everything um, in between, again, to make sure that their event is a huge success and then they want to come back to Wichita. And then, of course, we have to sell more of our Wichita wonderful experiences, so there's more must-sees, and this is always a very popular site for our meeting planners to go to. And then we get down to additional information, and this is all live, so, again, customizable. This shows the downtown dining, and it can show everything around because they always want to know, like, what's near the convention center? And so it's easy for them to navigate and get a good picture of what we have to offer. Entertainment. And then we end with some incredible um, 360 tours. So during the pandemic, we went out to all of our hotels and our attractions and have incredible 360 tours. So now when our meeting planner is sitting wherever they are across the country and they're thinking about where they're going to have their off-site, we actually just show them right here in the bid. So we know they need an offsite. For example, we're using Botanica. And in Botanica alone, I think there's 27 different um, tours that we can take them through to show. And then we close it out with any other pertinent information. So this would be how we go about presenting um, Wichita. And I will tell you, it's extremely customizable. We get incredible feedback. The meeting planner moves throughout. We're able to see when they open it, what they view, how long they stay. And this is how we get on the consideration set. So now as I escape out of that, let's get out of that. I'll get back to 
Oh, I'm going to need someone else Yikes. to help me on that one. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, we'll pull back up my presentation in a second. So I think I'll pull it back up. So after we've done that, we get on the consideration set. And so, for example, for our um, soccer, we put out the bid, and they chose three communities to come and visit. So now they're coming into our market. And now they're in Wichita, and we are showing them why Wichita. They love the bid, and they're here. And we wanted to you know, really go that extra step. So we bring them into the office at Wichita and visit Wichita. They meet everybody on our team, and they understand that when they choose Wichita, they are a big fish. And we are going to make sure everybody is behind them, not just visit Wichita, but the city, the county, and the state. So we brought the rights holders into our office, and then we showed them this video. Hi, I'm Mayor Brandon Whipple, and I want to welcome members of the U.S. Youth Soccer Organization to Wichita. We're thrilled for the opportunity to host the U.S. Soccer 2023 National President's Cup right here in the heart of the country. I'm confident your athletes and their families will enjoy their time in our great city. We truly appreciate you considering the city of Wichita, and we hope to see you in 2023. Hi, I'm Cedric County Commissioner Sarah Lopez, and welcome to Wichita. We are so thrilled for the opportunity to host the U.S. Youth Soccer 2023 National President's Cup right here in Wichita. As a mom with a child who plays competitive soccer at Stryker, I can tell you that I know your athletes and their families are going to really enjoy our facility and all the amenities that Wichita has to offer. I am so appreciative for this opportunity and hope to see you in 2023. I'd just like to take this opportunity to speak on the uh, bid that Wichita has made for the National uh, President's Cup in 2023. I spent a lot of time in Wichita. Um, I know um, how well they put on tournaments there from a youth level. I think it'll be a great opportunity for anyone who's gonna decide to come to Kansas. I think the facilities are great and I, I give nothing but support and I think it'd be a great place. Even though they're finalists, they should, they should be the place that uh, this event should be held and uh, hope to see it happen. Hi, my name is Roy Turner, and I arrived in Wichita in 1979 to coach a professional soccer team. We also started the game of soccer for the youth. It was a kickstart, and since then I've seen this town grow so much in its participation in this great game we call football. Wichita is a secret. Not many people realize what a great place it is to be. We now have great entertainment, food, dining, everybody, for moms and dads to come to this great city and enjoy themselves. You know, I think it's the greatest place in the world. Come and see our secret, Wichita, Kansas. Hi, my name is Sydney Andrews. I play for the U.S. Deaf Women's National Team, and I was born and raised in Wichita. Welcome to Wichita. We are so excited for the opportunity to host U.S. Youth Soccer 2023 President's Cup. We think that you and your families will enjoy Wichita and hope that you enjoy your stay. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and hopefully we get to see you in 2023. Hey everyone, my name is David Toland, and I'm proud to serve as Governor Laura Kelly's Lieutenant Governor for the state of Kansas. We're so excited for the opportunity to host the U.S. Youth Soccer National President's Cup here in the great state of Kansas. We firmly believe Wichita is the perfect location right in the center of the action to welcome young athletes and their families from across the country. And we can guarantee that the city, county, and state all stand ready to collaborate and partner with U.S. Youth Soccer to put on the best President's Cup yet. Kansans love soccer. It's played in every corner of our state and everywhere in between. There is tremendous energy around soccer in our state, whether we're talking about our countless youth soccer teams or our state's only major league sports team, Sporting KC, which is just down the road at Children's Mercy Park in Kansas City. The state of Kansas is already a committed partner to the truly world-class striker sports complex, which will be a terrific venue to host this exciting tournament. This facility was built for this moment, and we are ready to show soccer fans from across the U.S. the best of Midwest and Kansas hospitality. With its outstanding mix of food, entertainment, and recreation, we know that Wichita is the perfect city for young families to visit and enjoy. There is so much to see and do, and we know you'll agree once you get out and experience it. So we hope you all enjoy your time in Wichita, and we look forward to having you back in town very soon for the President's Cup. Good luck. Gotta have the kids in the video. So that just kind of shows, you know, for that event, we leave no stone unturned. 
We were down to two finalists, uh, Tampa Bay and Wichita. Uh, they came in on three different occasions. We showed them the city. They see the support. They loved hearing from the mayor, from the uh, county and the state, and they understood that when they come here, we are all behind them and we'll do everything we can to help be successful. We beat out Tampa Bay and we won the right to host this event. And this, um, let's see, this one event will bring in an estimated $4 million in economic impact. So 104 teams from around the country will be out at Stryker from July 6th through 11th. And I love when I chat with people to talk about it, because a lot of times people will see, hey, there's a lot of soccer players. You know, how, how, did, how did that happen? They just came. And I'm like, well, there's a little bit behind how come they're here and, and how, they, how they chose Wichita. Um, but again, over $4 million economic impact for that one event. And when we have great facilities like Stryker, we're able to bring um, incredible events here. So in this, what we love about this is this is these athletes, this is their, um, you know, Olympics. And so they bring their entire family they go visit our attractions and they stay all week. So if you're out and about this summer in July and you see a lot of soccer players, you'll know um, how we won the opportunity to host them. So thank you for giving me a few minutes just to kind of walk you through. Again, we do this for every group, every sporting event that we can bring here. Um, when we can get them here and show off our incredible city, uh, we're positioned well to continue to drive economic impact through tourism to the city of Wichita. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for... Councilmember Ballard. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say um, great job on the video. It's really impressive, and thanks for all your hard work to uh, bring the tournament to Wichita. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I just didn't want to thank um, Lindsay and Jesse and the city staff for all that they do. They are an incredible team. Councilmember Buba. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and, and just kind of looking through your, through your spin, Susie, it look, looks like you're bringing in or you're projecting $3.6 million worth of revenues? Yes. Um, so just kind of looking at 2.46 revenues, um, but toward leisure travel, 545 on marketing. Um, the 642,000, that, that, is that like your, your salaries, your rent? Yeah, um, all that or what the, the bulk of that goes on over to personnel. So what we've done from the very beginning of setting up the TBID is allocated us an amount that goes over into our general fund to help offset salaries. Okay. And that and that amount is usually never more than I think fifteen percent of the total. So So that's yeah. total salaries? All yes. the salaries? How yeah. many people is that? Well, we, we allocated an amount, and it's done from the very beginning. What we did originally when the T-bid was um, designed is looked at, try to look at hours and a percentage and took it over. So we've added bodies, but it goes into the general um, personnel fund. So, so, so that's not the total? Of, of, of salaries? Oh, for Visit Wichita? No. That comes out of the transit guest tax. Okay. How much is, comes out of the transit guest tax for that? The bulk of it. Uh, so um, I, what's a dollar amount? I, I don't have that in front of me. I'm happy okay. to get that Could back you to you. Could you send that to me? Yeah. I'll okay. have um, Stacy can follow up directly with you. Okay. Thanks. Happy to. Councilmember Fry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, appreciate the presentation, Susie. And as you know, the mayor and I both serve on the Visit Wichita board. Last week at our board meeting, you shared some uh, first quarter results on some hotels, uh, occupancies, and so forth that were new numbers that we'd never broached before. Could you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, and Stace, do you have the exact ones with you? I'll just tell you, and I'll circle back, and I should have that, and I, I apologize. I'm a little, well, a little hazy, but I'll tell you, it was our best first quarter ever. So on the STAR report, best demand revenue that we've ever had. And we're continuing to build on the momentum that we've had in the last several quarters. And I, and I think we're seeing, the point of this is I think we're seeing that with the amount that we're seeing in leisure expenditures and the test markets and so forth. Thank you. I, and so seeing that success in the results um, is a good indicator. So thank you. Thank, thank you. And it's great to see our hoteliers, right, with not only their demand, but their average rate, rate and their revenue, because that's what they take to the bank. So it's yeah. really great to see them bouncing back. Thank you for those comments. Yeah, and I'll just say that the good news makes up for the fact that the meeting's at 7 a.m. or 7 <laughs> <laughs> But there's bacon. Yes, yes, and, and they bacon. also bring coffee and that's bacon. Uh, Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just wanted to say, appreciate the presentation. This is really good information. I guess my only concern was there was no lieutenant governor versus mayor for the video. No. We, we the know Sarah would have won with that one, though. <laughs> good job. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Council Member Tuttle. Thank you. I'm going to be a little redundant and thank you as well. And I was involved with the striker process and worked with the striker team and wrote a letter of support. So I know the process and how much you put into it. Um, I'm excited for July 6th through the 11th, but I've already warned my husband we won't probably be eating out anywhere in District 2 during that time because they're going to have so many visitors there. But that's great. And it's wonderful. And any Saturday that there's tournaments there, you see all the soccer teams, the soccer families that come, they're eating out, they're shopping, they're staying in their hotels. It's exactly what we want to have happen. Um, the other thing I just want to point out, something that's always very important to me, and you and I have talked about this a lot, when my since I've been on, on council, is I'm a numbers person. And so you always provide us with measurable objectives. And so for the people who are in the audience or maybe watching online or watch this later, um, if they go into the agenda packet, there are deliverables for return on investment, number of nights. And so that makes it even easier for us to support this because we know when you've met your benchmark. So thank you for all you do. We really appreciate what you do for Wichita. Well, thank you. And I want to thank you with, with it, Stryker being in your district. That's just a huge, huge asset. So thank you for all you've done for that facility. And uh, also just I have a few members from the team here, head of marketing and our head of finance, Stacy and Brandy and everybody back incredible team uh, back in the office that makes this possible. I just get to stand before you, but they, they do the lion's share. So just wanted to recognize them as well. Further <coughs> questions? See none. Thank you. And input from the public. See none. We'll bring discussion back to the bench. If there is no further discussion, I again want to uh, uh, thank Susie for, for being here, uh, especially so close to surgery. Uh, it, it says a lot, I, I think, about your commitment to not only this organization, but uh, frankly, to uh, uh, the growth uh, and uh, development of, of our city. Uh, when we consistently uh, over overachieve the projections for sales tax. I think a lot of it has to do with the work that you all are doing, bringing people in. Uh, they might be here for an event, but they're going out to eat. They're, they're buying stuff while they're here. Uh, and it just really shows uh, uh, that not only is this important uh, of getting the story of Wichita out further than, than just our region uh, by bringing folks in, uh, but also that there's a huge economic benefit that we see every quarter when we get our, our, uh, our quarterly updates. And we just want to appreciate that and recognize that you're, you're a part of that. And if there's no further questions or discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the Tourism Business Improvement District, TBID, for 2024 scope of services and budget. Is there a second? Second, second by Vice Mayor Holheisel, I think. Uh, clerk will open the roll. Members cast the vote. I've received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. 2023 to 2024, fifth program year HUD annual action plan. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. My name is Logan Bradshaw. I'm the Assistant Director of Housing and Community Services for the City of Wichita. And today I'm here to bring to you for review and consideration our 2023-2024 fifth program year HUD annual action plan. Each year, we receive an annual allocation of funds from HUD for community development activities, and those activities align to the city's goal of creating a livable and sustainable community, as well as affordable housing for Wichitans. Here's an overview of our entitlement grants on this slide. CDBG is by far and large our most flexible funding source, and it can be used for a wide range of community development needs. Our home program is all about the production of affordable housing, as well as increasing the supply of affordable housing in Wichita. And ESG is the grant that we have from HUD to address homelessness in our community. So sometimes when we are coming to you for review and consideration of our annual allocation plan, we do not yet have our award amounts for the upcoming year. However, um, thanks to timely congressional appropriations, we do have those already, and those are outlined for you here on the slide. I do want to make you aware that the funding allocations that we will be proposing for both CDBG and HOME are actually going to be in excess of the amount we are slated to receive for next program year. And that is because we are proposing to use both unallocated and reallocated funds to supplement our CDBG allocations as well as unallocated funding to supplement our home. 
And what you need to know about unallocated funds is that sometimes we pool unallocated funds when grant program income is generated. And so there are activities that we do within CDBG and HOME that actually generate loan repayments back to the city. And here in the last 18 months or so, we have had two um, rather large loan repayments paid back for CDBG and HOME, which has um, caused us to pool unallocated funds that we have to then reallocate out so that we are not at risk of losing those funds in our community. Additionally, we are recommending a reallocation of $270,000 in CDBG funds um, that come from two programs that have underspent. And so um, that is going to account for the reallocated funds that you see being programmed for CDBG. Um, one of those programs is from our commercial building facade imp uh, improvement program. We are proposing to reallocate the $150,000 we had set aside for that program to another activity in CDBG. Unfortunately, the, um, the interest that we've seen in that program is unfortunately from entities that would not be eligible for CDBG um, or are for individuals who are trying to improve um, you know, the facade of their homes. And so we have to, especially when we get to the fifth year of our five-year consolidated planning period, we have to make sure we're looking at what activities are underspending in order not to have those funds um, swept. The other... Um, activity that we are proposing to reduce the previous allocation for is our small business assistance um, pot. So we had $220,000 set aside um, to be able to fund CDBG eligible Propel applications. Unfortunately, we haven't had any applications that have come in that would be um, meeting a CDBG national objective for economic development activities. And so we don't want to get rid of the entire allocation of $220,000. We simply would like to reduce that to $100,000 while we try and work through more creative ways, possibly reach out to HUD for some technical assistance on how we can qualify projects, and then reprogram the $120,000 for another activity. And, um, and then in the future, if we are able to make more CDBG eligible Propel loans work, then we can look at maybe addi uh, putting additional funds into that pot at that time. Um, but at this point, we are getting to the end of that five-year period. It's important for us to um, make sure we are putting funds towards activities that are fully spending instead of um, activities that might not have any expenditures yet. And I'll point those out when we get to that section of the PowerPoint as well. To give you some context on our planning process, um, we are required by HUD to submit a high-level overarching five-year plan that identifies broad community needs and spending priorities for our entitlement grant programs. And with, and that's called our consolidated plan. And then for each individual year within that five-year period, HUD tells us, okay, now we need a more detailed spending plan that tells us exactly what you plan to spend your funds on um, for that upcoming program year. And so that's called our program year annual action plan, which is what we have um, for you to consider today. We did open our public comment period at the end of March for our fifth year AAP. We attended all of the district advisory boards in the month of April to solicit public comment, as well as made our plan available on our website so people could submit as much public comment as they wish. We did um, get some very supportive feedback for our preliminary spending plan from the DABs and have not yet received any other public comment at this time, though we will be able to take public comment at today's meeting. Um, prior to closing out the um, public hearing. And so the preliminary spending plan that you see in front of you today is the same thing that we presented at all of the April District Advisory Board meetings. We have to submit our fifth year AAP to HUD no later than May 15th, and what it does is allocates funds from July of this year through June of next year. So one part of our annual planning process is the convening of a grants review committee. And what this committee does is review proposals and applications that are submitted in response to a request for proposal process from community service providers for specific aspects of CDBG, ESG, and HOME that we take out for RFP. And that committee convened last year. Um, and made selection and funding recommendations for youth crime prevention and enrichment, domestic violence shelter services, homeless prevention, and homeless assistance funding categories. And so we did something last year that helped um, to reduce administrative burden for this year in that we let last year's GRC and RFP process actually inform a two-year funding cycle, which allowed us to close out our consolidated planning period 
Um, this is something that jurisdictions across the community do. Um, it helps to, like I said, reduce that administrative burden in reconvening, reassembling an RFP, getting the review committee together every single year. It feels like as soon as we finally get these subrecipients up and running uh, with their new contracts, um, it's time to de decide what we're going to do next year. So the award amount that you are going to see recommended for those funding activities that I mentioned on the last slide, um, that is actually just a um, renewal of what they received last year at the recommendation of both the Grants Review Committee, the Continuum of Care for these uh, facets that go out for Emergency Solutions Grant, as well as at your recommendation from your approval last year. So um, pending approval today, and once our um, new uh, plan period starts, we will go ahead and renew those contracts for a second year, funding them at the same level they were funded at last year. So now we'll get into individual funding allocations for each of our three entitlement grants. The first that we'll talk about is CDBG. In order for an activity to be CDBG eligible, it must meet one of three national objectives, um, either benefiting low to moderate income persons or households, preventing slum or blight, or addressing any urgent community needs. HUD tells us that we have to make sure that 70% of our CDBG funds are met, um, are spent on activities that meet that first national objective to benefit low to moderate income persons or households. Our first allocation is to the Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department. We have an MOU with them to um, demo and clear any blighted structures, and so we are proposing $224,000 for that um, program. As you can see on this chart, we have not made any funding allocations to them in the third or fourth program year as they were still working to expend their first and second program year allocations. They have now committed all of those funds and are ready for additional funding. And so we are recommending um, in consultation with them, of course, um, understanding how many homes might be in the pipeline that would be CDBJ eligible, a $224,000. Additionally, on this slide, you can see where we are proposing to um, eliminate the commercial building facade improvement program and take that $150,000 and reprogram it elsewhere, as well as reducing the amount that we had set aside for small business assistance from two hundred and twenty dollars to 100000 Additionally, we are able to make that allocation of um, $224,000 to MABCD due to dipping into our unallocated pot of funds. Next, we'll talk about housing activities that are carried out with CDBG. We are proposing just shy of $1.8 million for our home improvement program suite of um, programs. So about $1.3 million of that are for actual hard costs for labor and materials to actually make repairs to individuals' homes. And then four hundred and sixty dollars is um, what's called program delivery costs or staff salary and benefits for an overhead cost for the staff that administer that program in our department. Again, you can see here um, that we are proposing to use that 270 to supplement the Home Improvement Program Services pot. This program is very popular. There is great need for home improvement um, program and home repair programs in Wichita. And so this, this program historically spins down relatively quickly. And so um, we are proposing to use those reallocated funds as well as the remainder of the unallocated funding to support home improvement program services. This slide's pretty simple. CDBG allows us for us to take 20% off of the top of our annual allocation for administration, so staff salaries, benefits, overhead, IT costs, things like that, for um, us to administer the CDBG program, as well as the um, indirect cost, which is just factored by taking the city's 2023 indirect cost rate and applying it to the grant. Again, that's just shown for the last five years what we have um, programmed for administration and planning. Next, we'll talk about public services. Um, as you can see, we are pretty public services heavy here at the city of Wichita. We are grandfathered in at a public services cap of $1,163,000 approximately, and we allocate right up to that public services cap 
um, pretty much every single year. Um, these funds will support our Office of Community Services staff and overhead at Atwater, Evergreen, and Colvin for $385,000, as well as provide <coughs> program delivery or staff salary and benefit costs for the individual in our department who administers the Housing First program. So as you know, Housing First program funds are supplied by general funds as well as county funds, but we actually support that individual's staff salary and benefits with Community Development Block Grant. I'll talk about um, domestic violence, shelter services, youth crime prevention and enrichment, and summer youth employment on subsequent slides. Again, domestic violence shelter services, this was taken out as a two-year funding RFP and recommended again here for the second year of that. You see the amounts on this slide. We fund Catholic Charities Harbor House, Stepstone, as well as Wichita Family Crisis Center. Same on this slide, youth services, two-year RFP. Um, we are recommending to fund them at the same amount they were funded at in the first year, and we fund the um, YMCA as well as Kansas Big Brothers Big Sisters. We also fund a youth activity latchkey program at Colvin Elementary um, through our Park and Recreation Department, and you see the amount here. This was a need and a gap that was identified in our five-year consolidated planning period, and so we funded Plainview and Park and Recreation through an MOU for every um, year of that five-year period, and so we are proposing to do that again. And then finally, to round out public services, we do have our Way to Work Youth Employment Program that we are proposing $200,000 be allocated for. This is the same, excuse me, this is the same amount of funds that um, has been allocated for every single year of our five-year period, and these funds will support the Way to Work Youth Employment Program for next summer. We are using current program year dollars to support the program for this summer. And then as you can see here, um, our public services look back over the five-year period. Next, we'll talk about the Home Investment Partnerships Program. Again, this is our grant that's all about um, increasing the supply of affordable housing. <laughs> Again, we are proposing an allocation amount over and above what we are slated to receive for this upcoming program year due to an infusion of those unallocated funds. Program administration and indirect charges, again, very simple. We are allowed to take 10% off of our annual allocation for program administration and indirect charges. For our Homeownership 80 program, which is our down payment and closing cost assistance program for low to moderate income um, households, first time ho um, home buyers, excuse me, we are proposing just shy of $820,000. And then for our Housing Development Loan Program, or HDLP as you'll hear me call it, as well as our Community Housing Development Organization Set Aside, or CHODO as you'll hear me call it, we are proposing to um, allocate just over $1.2 million. So HDLP is home program funds that are provided to nonprofit and for-profit housing developers to either build or rehabilitate housing. And so one thing to know about HDLP is typically in the past, the vast majority of our HDLP, as well as our community housing development organization set-aside funds, have been for the development of single-family infill new construction housing. However, HDLP, as you might remember from a few weeks ago, can also be used to provide gap financing for multifamily rental projects, as well as single-family rental projects. So just something to keep in mind with HDLP. I mentioned the CHOTO set-aside requirement. So we are required by HUD to make sure that at least 15% of our home allocation each year goes to CHOTOs. And so as I mentioned, priority for this funding has typically been the development of single-family housing for home ownership. This is because that's the work that our CHOTOs do in Wichita. Um, we will in the future manage our CHOTO set-aside requirement through the HDLP program, as well as having the Affordable Housing Review Board, once that board is completely filled, to review HDLP and CHOTO set-aside HDLP applications. So just a note on, on that, we did have, as part of last year's RFP process, we did go out for RFP for Community Housing Development Organization set-aside. Um, however, the Grants Review Committee at that time deferred voting on those applications or really considering those applications in order to let the Affordable Housing Review Board review them. And so as soon as we have a full board, we'll take those applications, we'll you know, ask the community housing development organizations if they have any updates that they need to make, and then bring those applications back, 
probably is the first thing the Affordable Housing Review Board will take action on as a, as a body. Um, there are some special requirements to be a CHODO. Those are outlined on the slide. We have two active CHODOs in Wichita, pa um, Mennonite Housing as well as Jacob's Ladder. Power CDC is not currently active, but they are, are a, a CHODO that's done a lot of amazing work here in our community. We also have some entities in Wichita who, whose really their sole purpose is for the development of affordable housing, but they haven't necessarily gone through the steps to be qualified as a CHODO. And so we'll be working with those um, entities to see if we can provide some technical assistance because when our community has more CHODOs, we all win. And then finally, this is just our home allocation spreadsheet. You can see the allocations here as well as the infusion of those um, prior years unallocated funds. And finally, for our last entitlement grant, we'll talk about ESG. We use ESG in three ways here in our community. Um, we use it for shelter services, which is really about providing operational support to shelters. We use it for homeless prevention, which is about providing rent and utility assistance to individuals to keep them from becoming homeless, as well as we use it for rapid rehousing, which is very short term, no more than three months of assistance to people who are literally homeless to help get them stable and into housing. And then typically these individuals have income that can then support their housing moving forward. Again, for homeless assistance, as well as for homeless prevention, these funding amounts are for that second year of their two-year funding cycle. These are the exact same amounts that, we, um, that were approved last year and that are now being recommended this year for both homeless assistance as well as homeless prevention. You can see the five-year look back on this slide. And then finally, we are proposing to put 62,000 approximately in for our rapid rehousing program. We do administer that program within our department, as well as taking the 7.5% for program administration and indirect charges off the top for ESG. Here's the overview of the breakdown for ESG. And so finally, um, getting to the end of the presentation here, there is no impact to the general fund. Um, we have got, gone ahead and put the allocation amounts for the upcoming program year again on this slide, as well as making you aware that <coughs> the funding allocations for CDBG include reallocated and unallocated funding, as well as home, um, including that unallocated. Um, we will make sure that all funding agreements either already have been or will be approved as to form by the law department. And so as such, it's recommended that the City Council close the public hearing, approve the funding allocations and staff and grants review committee recommendations, authorize the submission of the 2023 AAP to HUD and authorize the funding agreements and necessary signatures. And with that, I can stand for whatever questions you might have. Vice Mayor Hall Heisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, how much, do we have any unallocated funds from ESG? We do not, no. So those actually have a much shorter performance period, and since we contract out most of those funds, um, our agencies are constantly spending those down. So we don't have any unallocated funding that we can use to supplement the ESG pot. Okay, I'm glad to hear a lot of the unallocated funding is going to address some of our housing needs. Um, does the Grant Review Committee decide where the unallocated funds go? They do not. So the Grants Review Committee only reviews the facets of CDBG and ESG, that go out for requests for proposals. Okay. So they do not have a say in where the un unallocated funding goes. Who, who says where the unallocated funding goes? We're making that as a recommendation to you. So you as a governing body have the ultimate authority on where those funds go. Okay, so just you guys internally um, had a discussion to figure out where the unallocated funding should go. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, Based on the, the needs that we're seeing in the community and the way in which that programs are spending down. Okay, and you talked about the facade program was not really very successful. Um, is that something we should work on, maybe trying to get the word out on some of these programs, going to um, neighborhood association meetings or mm -hmm. other community meetings? So what we did to try and help promote the facade improvement program, we made allocations in the first, second, and third program year. We worked with our communications team to help get the word, word out. We also did a designated mailer to um, uh, the zip codes in Wichita, to all businesses in the zip codes in Wichita that would most, the majority of the zip code would qualify for CDBG eligible. 
um, and really did not have much interest in that program at all. Uh, we didn't go out to neighborhood associations, um, but it's also my understanding that there might be some changes that are coming down the pipe with community improvement districts that could help meet the need that we were trying to fill with the neighborhood facade improvement program. So in addition to that and the fact that really the only entities that reached out to us that were interested were individuals who just didn't understand what the program was for, as well as um, we had a lot of churches reach out and unfortunately CDBG funds can't be used to improve the facade of um, religious institutions. So, um, but to answer your question, we did not go out to neighborhood association meetings or anything like that. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for staff? See none. Thank you. Input from the public on this item or parts of this item? Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Due to a personal conflict, I will be abstaining from this vote. Let the record show that Councilmember Johnson will be abstaining from this vote. Further discussion? If there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to close the public hearing, approve the funding allocations and staff and grant review committee recommendations, authorize submission of the 2023-2024 annual action plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and authorize the funding agreements and necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk, roll up and roll. Members cast the vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Madam Clerk. Oh, what? It was six to one. Who? Johnson. My apologies. Uh, yeah, I got a little carried away. Six yeas to one um, abstention. I, I thought you were saying that I forgot to vote or something, but now I understand what's. Thank you for that, and thank you to my vice mayor who helps co-pilot this meeting, um, Madam Clerk. Repair or removal of dangerous and unsafe structure. Hello. Good morning. I'm Kaylin Nethercott with MABCD. The property under consideration today is in District 1. The Board of Code Standards and Appeals first reviewed this property on April 4th, 2022, and again on June 6th, 2022. The address is 1312 North Wabash. It's had an open housing case for two years and 11 months. The property taxes are current. Um, I would note that the premises have been abated since these pictures were taken. So there is an outstanding billing of roughly $1,500 for the property cleanup. This property was placarded as uninhabitable in December 1994, November 2014, June 2016, and currently remains uninhabitable. This property was also in condemnation in May of 20, or excuse me, of 2009 and subsequently returned to regular code enforcement. The last water consumption at this property was in 1992 or earlier, um, and there is no meter at this address. One reported police incident has occurred at this location in the last five years. Um, it should be noted that on two separate occasions, WPD has requested assistance with this property. The current premise conditions are maintained after the abatement. The structure itself is a vacant fourplex with a cracking block foundation and rotting wood trim for the doors and the windows. I would note that a roof was installed last year without an issued permit and with no inspections having been performed. We did hold this property out of a formal condemnation, uh, out of moving it forward to give the owner time to follow up to do some cleanup and to pull a building permit and make additional repairs, that has not happened. Um, it should be noted that one unit has been illegally occupied earlier this year and had extension cords running to an adjacent structure for a power source. That situation has since been rectified. Um, and there you go. All right, questions for staff? If not, I'm going to relinquish the floor to Council Member Johnson as this resides in District 1. Thanks, Mayor. Um, is the property owner present today? Uh, yes, sir. Welcome. Well, a lot of that that, that, they, that she said is not true. I, when they, they got a stop work order on the permit, I put the roof on, 
I had run out of time for the premiere. I, ha I have a complete remodeling commit for that property. We run out of time and it expired. Central Inspection refused to give me an extension on the property to, to build, to, to redo it. And now, up until this point, you see they have a, in 2022 of June, it's been a whole year, they, they placarded it and told me to stay off my own property. The extension card that was running from that, adjacent to that property, was only being used to make repairs for electricity that I bought from the neighbor. Anybody that was on the property and in the property was there to keep vandals out of the property. I have guys watching the property. A lot of this stuff is, I don't know what Central Inspection's goal is to tear my property to demo it when I've been doing everything that they required for me to do, but they go and keep me from doing it. So at this time, I need more time and I don't, I have no intentions to have my property demo. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get my property up and running. I've been a community, I have been a member of that community for all my life. And I don't like to see my community did that way. If I could blink my eyes like I did Virginia, I'd have it done in that length of time. But right now, I need more time, and Central Inspection need to work with me. If I can't, if she says that I did not pull a permit, I pulled the permit. But then they, when it expired, they wouldn't come out and inspect the roof. So a lot of stuff that I had lined out to do, I even had an electrician. I have had plumbing work did. And when she, I mean, when Central Inspection would not extend my permit, then they shut me down. So it's, and, and saying it's got cracks in, the, in the, that thing, that's not true. That structure is sound after the roof is on. I couldn't put any doors up. I couldn't fix any windows because they put a stop work order and ordered me to stay off my own property. And I have no abatement. Nobody's cleaned that property up. If it was an abatement, it's not, that's not true. I've always kept that property clean up until this point where they put a stop work hard on it. So I'm not going to go out and clean up the property when you're going to demo it. So if, if I could get 120 days, I can bring the property up enough to get it back to Central Inspection where they can work with me to finish the remodeling uh, plan I got for it. I, I guess my question is, how did that property get into the condition that it that it was in the photos we saw? Come again? How did the property get into the condition that we saw in the photos? You, you said you've always kept it up. Yeah, that's that's roofing material. I had guys to cut the trees now. So we trimmed them off the top of the roof. The trees we was gonna completely remove. That's, that's another $2,500. But why would I remove trees and clean up when that's just gonna be a bill and you come and demo it? When they shut me down, that stuff you see on it now, that's still there because they shut me down. They told me to stay off the property. We cut the trees down to do the roof. So now you got me in a, a, a catch-22 situation where I'm gonna spend money for what? So until they give me a, a permit to do what I need to do, I'm here. So that, are, are you saying that's what occurred on April 4th of 2022? Because that is when the condemnation case was initiated. Yes. And then after that, in, in June of 2020, they put a... a stop order on it, they, and they wouldn't give me a permit. I mean, they wouldn't extend my permit. If I may. Yes. I don't want to steal your thunder. Mm -hmm. um, so in this instance, a contractor applied for a roofing permit and never paid for it. It was not issued. The work was not done under an issued permit. 
and no inspections were performed. Now, as is standard practice, when those types of building permits expire on properties that are under condemnations, a stop work order is placed on the parcel. Now, as a point of clarification on that, we have a system in MABCD, which was the old central. Um, if we receive a request for a stop work order to be lifted on a property that's under condemnation consideration, the permit writers forward that information to me, which gives us an opportunity to reach out to the property owner to schedule inspections, to do interior looks, those kinds of things. We have not received such a request on this property. Well, none of that's, none of that's true. I call Central Inspection and I asked them to work with me and get this, uh, get this where we could get it back rolling. And I was told, we're going to turn it over for condemnation. And this is the letter I got. I, I, I called her right back the day that I went to the, over there at the, the other building over there, and I called her and I said, what do I got to do to keep my property out of condemnation? And she said, you ain't going to do anything. You're going to stay off that property. And the next thing I know, it was placard. And they put dangerous uh, building and all that on, on the property. So I can't make them do anything, even though what they said is not true. Because I did call and talk to someone over in that other building. You, um, you indicated you pulled the permit. Do you have that permit with you? No, I had, I had the permit up in the window at the property where, where it belonged. But you would have had a receipt for paying for that permit. You'd have I some documentation. I had the contractor to pull the, the permit. Okay. So it sounds like the contractor may have uh, wanted to but never paid for that permit. Well, maybe that might be what happened, but he pulled the permit, and I placarded the permit as ordered in the window. That's where, that's where it's at. Now, because it's open and they placarded it, uh, someone broke the window out. I've been fighting. You know, if you, keep, if you tell me to stay off my own property, we got an officer to stay behind it. He's more trouble than the vandals. Because if he's saying that he's been keeping people off the property, he is a lie, plain and simple, because he hasn't. And so I, I, oh. you are requesting 120 days, and that property needs significant work. So you you would have it's, it's 1500 not. You would have $1,500 in the fees that were assessed to clean that property up in addition to what would be necessary to bring that property up to code. And it you, doesn't, they, they you are did. asking to do that in 120 days. Well, they, I don't owe them no $1,500 for a cleanup. They haven't did anything. The abatement that was just stated by uh, Ms. Nethercott was cleaning that property up, and that assessment would be $1,500. Well, they don't have to clean up my property. I can do it myself. I mean, it, it's done now. No, it's not. It's, it's not done. That's um, that, that, that property is in the same where I cut the trees down. So I, I just want to just because we, we don't need a back foot debate. Uh, nine times out of 10 when folks come here and there's a conflict of what is happening is nine times out of 10 in my experience. It, it's a uh, usually an example of miscommunication uh, where either uh, there was something missed, which sounds like in this case, or uh, something that w w was taken differently. So I, I just want to uh, uh, encourage just a, a little bit of grace in a conversation so it doesn't become an accusatory uh, argument where, well, he said, she said type situation, right? Like, I think that we all want um, our structures and our property and uh, really uh, our housing to, to be of a, a, a quality standard that's deserving of Wichita. We all have that same goal. Uh, but I just want to throw out that uh, when, when there's miscommunication, I, I don't want that to turn into accusations because it, it really distracts for, from the, the conversation. Um, my, so my apology. I just want to, be, because I, sometimes I, we get in these situations and it winds up in, intensifying, and I want to make sure that doesn't happen because we're here uh, uh, for, for the community, uh, uh, and I think we all share our love for community, as you stated in your opening remarks. Uh, but yes, go ahead and, uh, and, I'm, and I apologize to Councilmember Johnson uh, for, for getting in, but, but I have to make sure that we, we, we stay on the same track. Yes, ma'am. 
So um, if it would be council's desire, if you would like to give the owner, um, obviously I'm just meeting him. So if you'd like to give him additional time, I can tell you what that would look like from MABCD's perspective. So we would obtain contact information from him. We would schedule what's called a special inspection to review the interior of the structures, um, to inspect whatever roofing work has been performed, and then a written report would be provided back to us for use in the issuance of any building permits for remodel rehab that he might want to ask for. I'm fairly confident in this instance that it would, there would be trades permits required as well given the, the status of HVAC, electric, those sorts of things. It is a fourplex, so that means it would need to be comprehensive. In other words, you can't do one unit, open it up, do the next unit, open it up. That's not how it works on building permits for these structures. So that's what, if council desires, that's what we would do moving forward. Well, let me ask you a question before I take any Of course, sir. The, the floor is yours, sir, so please. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, see, I don't understand if she's talking about I got to get the com property completely up. So I would need more time than that, but if it could get where it would be safe and closed up in order for us to work on four units, because actually I was going to convert two units into one, the, the rear one. So, see, as you just said, it was, it's a communicational problem. Because if I had understood this, we could have worked before they placarded it or whatever. But see, I didn't know any of this. So I have to understand if I have to have it all completed and up. Well, I'm, I'm not, not going to be able to do that in no 120 days. But I can do enough where we'll be in process and it won't be an eyesore as they think. But... I don't, you know, I'd be willing to work within 120 days to talk to her and see if we can do enough to get it out of condemnation as I move forward in it. Well, that was, that was why I asked you when you said 120 days. So your best bet is going to always be to stay in communication with Ms. Nethercott. Right. And when I asked you about the 120 days, that was because you'd have to repair that whole building. That's why I mentioned the significant cost right. of that. Right. Well, see, I didn't understand that. So how much time would you say you would need for that entire fourplex? Probably the time that I've been shut down, which would have been a year. See, I more than likely in the, when it got shut down in June, I did nothing else to it. Now, it's less than uh, a month before being June. See, I did nothing for a full year. See, I could have had basically the structure probably up and habitable by now. See, so I'm trying to get it where it doesn't have to come before y'all now that I understand to get it out of the condemnation and work with central inspection as, as I move forward. And yep. she could tell me what I need to do in line to get it up enough to pull it out of, out of condemnation where I can proceed forward to get it completely done and habitable. Because my whole goal is to have it where it'll be affordable rental. You know, not because if I don't stay on a budget, I mean, even if I had $100,000 to just to dump in it, it wouldn't be a, a financial thing for somebody to come and live in it at affordable price. So I'm with on, in a budget where I can keep the rental it nice and, you know, nice and but not outrageous to be rented. If it pleases the council member, if I could yeah. rise to a point of information, uh, just one of the, uh, and we review these cases on a case by case basis. Sometimes folks come in and uh, talk to us about their plans to renovate it and we're happy to give uh, more time uh, in those situations. I do have a question possibly for staff. Uh, if we were to, it, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, sir, it sounds like your request is if we get 120 days, you can bring the structure up to uh, structural integrity. Um, yes. However, if you wanted to get it to the position in which it could be inhabitable, uh, that would take perhaps a year. And I'm just wondering with, yes. with staff, uh, if 
uh, I guess, it could, is there a precedence for a, a more step approach where, it, let's say, in 120 days, gentleman comes back, shows us the progress, uh, and then we could extend if that progress meets satisfaction. Uh, is there a way in which, I, I guess, we've, we've done this type of um, step approach in the past? Because I, I, what I want to avoid is, is basically a blanket timeline uh, if, if that's the direction the council goes, a whole year, um, it, and then you know, we're not having that step approach to get it back, uh, back on, uh, really, back to where the property should be. I'm not aware of historical precedents that would support that. I believe typically when deferrals are made, the expectation from council has been that the repairs would be substantially complete, that there would have been a valid building permit in place, um, systems work done, inspections performed, those types of things. Now, um, this is a fourplex. It is a large scope of work. Um, I, would, I would simply point out that um, we've, we've had housing cases on this property for up to three years. That has not proven successful yet. And I realize there are all sorts of reasons why there can be delays, absolutely. Um, so if council would wish to extend this, we will, we could do, excuse me, quarterly updates and report back to you exactly what we're seeing in our MABCD system and what our building inspectors would be seeing as progress because at that point, the work would be inspected by our building and trades inspectors. I hope that kind of answers your question. I appreciate the added information. Mm -hmm. Councilmember yes. Johnson, I apologize for utilizing your time. No problem, Mayor. Um, so I'm not comfortable with a year, but um, since you have been uh, making some efforts, I want to encourage you to stay in contact with Ms. Nethercott. As you brought up um, affordable housing units, renting those out, I will also tell you I care very deeply about the quality of life and the quality of living spaces that are provided, and that building needs significant work. And I hope that you can get that done in the right way. While I'm not comfortable with a year, I am comfortable with giving you six months. And in six months, if you can make substantial um, improvement to that space, um, by your estimate, a year you'd be done, in six months you'd be halfway done. That means permits would be pulled, work would be done, and we would see some drastic improvements in that space, as well as the specials that have been incurred being paid as well. Um, so I am willing, I don't know if anyone else had comment, but I would um, be willing to push this until November and then have a report back. Um, but I will say that in November, if substantial progress has not been made, those are the types of structures I also hear about quite a bit in the neighborhood as being concerns from people uh, around there. So I do hope that uh, you are successful and I would move that we defer this item to the November 7th, 2023 council meeting. So there has been a motion, I'm writing this stuff down, so my apologies. Uh, however, we do have a member on the board. Uh, so. Um, We'll let the members speak before the seconding. If the, if the motion earns a second, uh, I'll, I'll second the motion. Second the motion, so speaking to the motion, uh, let's keep this, I guess, cleaner. Uh, Council Member Blue by, uh, the, the floor is yours. Council Member Johnson, do we have some kind of benchmark or threshold that you would say, if this is not accomplished, this does not need to come back to Council? And, it, and it, you know, I, I don't want to utilize 45 minutes of the council's time again if there's not been substantial work done? Um, yes, I have done that before. I just wanted to give him a chance to make his case. Um, I know that our staff will be able to provide all information of permits being pulled, and I don't think it would be 45 minutes at that point. And, and frankly, it sounds like, my, my apologies, council member, did you ever follow up? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, in my, uh, uh, frankly, my experience and what, what I think could happen is if this does come back and we don't have significant uh, a movement on this at that point, uh, it would be quite a, probably, <laughs> I don't predict this, but probably a short discussion uh, yeah. because at that point, we, we would have no choice but to uh, move forward with the recommendations uh, to, to eliminate the structure. And one of the issues, I'll just speak to this briefly, 
uh, we want good housing. We want our neighborhoods to, to have uh, affordable housing. And so it, it's tough every time we have these type of cases uh, because you know our goal is to bring things up to standards uh, and no one wants empty lots. Uh, so uh, we try to work with folks because we, we, we seriously do want uh, not only um, you know, uh, people to, to be able to uh, uh, have access to the property and to better their property, uh, but but also every time a structure, we lose a unit, we, we lose a, a potential housing unit for a family. Um, so, but with that said, one of the issues when this stuff becomes unaddressed is basically these houses become a magnet for unlawful activity. Uh, and sadly, we've seen... Um, particularly when it gets cold out, folks who, who are experiencing homelessness or unhoused who uh, might find a way into a, a abandoned structure and try to utilize a fireplace. Uh, so it becomes a hazard for not just the property owner, but also for the community if a fire breaks out uh, or if, God forbid, uh, a child or someone was, was dragged into this type of structure. So this bench, we, we do try to balance uh, public safety with uh, uh, the, the rights of owners and also with our, um, our goal of reducing dangerous uh, and structures that, that could lead to blight as well. So I uh, just want to get, throw that out there that that's the thought process that we usually go through uh, when it comes, when we have to weigh these out. Uh, however, if you are willing to work with uh, our, our team and basically be persistent. Um, you know, the, these folks, uh, they, they do, uh, we, we have a huge city uh, and our staff has a lot on their plate. Uh, they really do amazing work with what they have. Uh, so, you know, if for some reason you reach out or you make a call and you don't get the call back, please don't accept that as a soft no. Uh, in my experience working with in, in government, uh, make sure you call back, make sure you follow up um, because usually sometimes in, in Maybe you'd agree. Uh, some weeks are, are might be a little more hectic that, uh, than others, uh, and we have a lot going on in, in the background that I think wind up uh, might be mis miscued as um, a, uh, a a negative gesture, uh, but it's not su supposed to be that way. Uh, if someone doesn't return, just make sure that you continue to to try to open that line of communication and email us if you if you have a problem with that, because uh, a lot of times we can help uh, uh, just uh, alert staff that. There's a, a time's ticking on this project, and we want to make sure that you get the services you need for our city so that you can do all you can. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say that um, we do field about 22,000 calls a year in just our area in neighborhood inspections. So if you do have to leave a message, you will get a call back. It may not be in the next 30 minutes, but you will get a call back in a timely manner. And how many folks are, are staffed in your department? Um, when we're fully staffed, we have 25. Four of those ladies are tasked with answering the phones. And there is a special place in heaven for them. So. <laughs> so, um, yeah, with that, there was a motion and a second to extend out six months. Uh, so is that going to uh, allow you enough time to really uh, hopefully make, make some progress on this so when you come back, uh, we, we can get, get a, a positive update and, and hopefully be able to extend out uh, to, to what you need to, to make this where, yes. where it needs to be? Yes. Excellent. I mean, yeah, six months. I mean, if you could give me a little more, it'd be fine, but I can probably get a substantial amount done working with them as we get the repairs done and able to get the inspectors out. And I'll contact her and get get them to do a walkthrough to see what I need to have done. So the, in, in the, what will likely happen is in six months, because as you mentioned, you're likely going to need longer than six months. When it comes back, we'll go right. through a similar process. Right. And if we see significant uh, um, uh, progress, then we can extend out the next uh, six months uh, or however time's needed. Um, but this would be uh, likely if there's not significant progress, if there's other uh, issues, uh, you know, this, the, it would be tougher to justify um, giving more right. time if we don't see that. So we, wanna, we want you to be successful. Right. And, Work with our staff, and we want we want uh, our neighborhoods to uh, uh, all these structures to be up to par. So, um, if that's enough time, and, and I did second the motion, I do appreciate Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Johnson, uh, I, I did defer the floor to you, and I think I took it a couple times. So please feel free to uh, uh, take the floor. Um, and do you have any closing remarks? No, I just look forward to the progress update in six months. Okay. 
Excellent. We appreciate you being here and suffering through the entirety of the meeting to get to this um, to get to this item. We know that uh, um, th these can can go a little long, so we appreciate your your perseverance as well. Uh, with that, there was a motion, and a motion has been seconded. Uh, we would ask the clerk to open the roll, and members can um, members can can cast their vote. And this is a motion to extend the timeline for six more months for this gentleman. That motion passes unanimously with seven yay votes. Thank you so much. Please make sure that uh, you get all the numbers necessary uh, so that uh, we, we can get rolling on this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And ma'am, thank you as always. Thanks for your time. Of course. Um, Madam Clerk, do we, we still got stuff? What, what's next, Madam Clerk? <laughs> Airport Information Technology High Level Design, Dwight D. Dwight D. Eisenhower National Airport. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Good morning. Morning. I think it's still morning. A little background, the airport uh, IT network infrastructure structure was significantly improved in 2015 in conjunction with the new terminal construction. So yes, that was eight years ago, and I would just kind of add that in addition to eight years being open, there was also a design period and procurement process, so we're looking at stuff that is a little older than that closer to 10. In anticipation of a needed technology refresh, the uh, Wichita Airport Authority contracted for a 10-year IT capital plan to address the cost and timing of the necessary projects. A high-level design project was identified by the, by the IT capital plan as a core building block for updating the network infrastructure. This was one of the projects that was slowed by COVID, so that's why we're getting back to it now. An RFQ process conducted in compliance with the city's policy and procedures selected faith group as best qualified. The professional services will provide design for a new network infrastructure supporting services and applications at Eisenhower and Jabbar airports. The city's IT department participated in the selection process and was involved in the scope definition of the contract. As it relates to scope of services, things that we're going to study and hope to get out of this, uh, we'll be looking at services and applications that support tenant operations as well as customer experience. Hope to provide a more modern Wi-Fi experience for the passengers and in the terminal and staff on the campus. Uh, there'll be some restructuring of back-end services and infrastructure. The new design will align with industry best practices and current trends in large campus network architecture. Cybersecurity threats will be reduced by performance enhance enhancements and modern technologies. Controlling the cost of maintenance and creation of revenue opportunities can be accomplished with improved network design uh, mentioning Wi-Fi again, uh, offer passengers higher bandwidth and more security with a uh, tiered system, uh, or we could use customer face IT systems for advertising rewards and more. So it just opens up a lot more opportunity for us. Our initial budget request is for $400,000 for project design and, and total project uh, potential expenditures. After the design is complete, a budget increase for implementation will be forthcoming. The lump sum contract with Faith, Faith Group for this high-level design effort is $346,320. This project is in the 2023 to 2032 adopted CIP and is funded fully by airport revenue. We recommend that the Wichita Airport Authority approve the project budget and the uh, contract and authorize the necessary signatures with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Questions for staff? Seeing none, well done. Uh, input from the public on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring discussion back to the bench for the discussion on this item. If there is no further discussion, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommendation to approve the project budget and the contracts and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members shall cast their vote. Have received seven yay votes. That motion does indeed pass. Madam Clerk. Council member appointments and comments. Sorry for the appointments. Any folks have appointments? Uh, if so, Chair recognizes Council Member Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. I'd like to appoint Olivia Black to the District 1 Advisory Board. Is there other appointments at this time so we can just make them all in one? Motion. If there are no further appointments, I'll make a motion to accept those appointments. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Ho Heisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members shall cast their vote. This is for a DAB appointment in District 1, I believe. 
have received 78 votes. That motion passes. Back on announcements, for the good of the body. Is there anything? Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I had two items, which I believe both would require council action. Um, first, I have been invited by um, folks at McConnell to a civic leader tour May 9th and 10th, which means I wouldn't be at the council meeting and this item would probably be on that agenda and was looking for approval from the council for that trip. Um, and then as well, that coincides with a number of cases that will be coming back to the council for district one on that day and would uh, like to, and I'll make motions, but also would like to push those off one week so that I could be here for those. Uh, so you won't get bogged down with seven cases from district one and me not being here. Yeah, I was going to say, are you mad at us? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I think uh, tighten our relationships with, with, with McConnell Air Force Base, of course, it is absolutely necessary. Uh, so I, I support that and appreciate the foresight of not um, having uh, basically Vice Mayor Hoheisel or someone else try to um, <laughs> navigate uh, what is otherwise District 1's uh, um, uh, lane. Uh, so can we make that in one motion or how does that work? It looks like the city manager has, is clicking around on his mouse, which means something's happening. So Chair recognizes City Manager Layton, the Honorable. Thank you, Mayor. Be confused with the there are three items that would appear on the unfinished council business item um, next week that I think Councilmember Johnson is referencing. Um, they are all repair and removal of dangerous and unsafe structures. One is at uh, 1239 North uh, Matheson. Uh, another is at 1518 North Green. And the other is at 1606 North Chautauqua. And those um, had all been... Um, the motion had put them on for the ninth, so I believe um, those three properties would need to be, um, the council would have to approve scheduling for another meeting. Okay. So I make a motion to accept and approve Councilmember Johnson's travel with the uh, leadership uh, organization for um, McConnell Air Force Base for both the 9th and the 10th, and also to uh, move the three items coming back to council under the No one's gonna help me out. Unf unfinished council business. Under the unfinished council business uh, to the following regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, from the 9th, which would be on May 16th. Does that make sense? Yep. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. Clerk will open a roll. Members will make their vote. No? I received 78 votes. That motion does pass. Thank you. Where are you training? Is there further conversation? Chair recognizes Council Member... Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on in District 6 this weekend. Um, on Saturday, we have the Arc River cleanup from 9 to noon. Signups are online, which you can find all of this information on the District 6 page. Uh, we also have a zero waste picnic that's going to be at um, Park Villa on Saturday as well. We have the open streets at Nomar on Sunday from noon to four, and we also have the Prairie Fire Marathon, so uh, don't get blocked in your house if you live in the Riverside area, so. I'm sorry? Half Marathon, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. My understanding is Councilmember Fry is running in that marathon, is that true? That's why it's half. <laughs> Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming out to Brush Up Broadway this last weekend. Uh, overwhelming success. Again, it's just showing a little love and care for an area of our community that needs it. Um, I would also like to send my condolences to the family of Chauncey Kemp. If you are um, somebody from the Plainview area or somebody in the know with a lot of the institutional families in the city, um, the Kemp's are well known 
he was a second generation dad member for District Three. So um, again, just like to offer my condolences to him, to his family, and um, we're thinking of them in this difficult time. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilmember Ballard. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, just thank you to everybody that made it out to um, the ICT Tree Fest in Delano. They had a, a really good crowd, and it was fun, and thanks for coming. Further discussion? All right, if there is no further, if there is no further discussion, then I will make a motion that we uh, move that the city council recess into executive session for 30 minutes to receive information on a, a potential civil case to KSA 754319B2 for legal consultation with the city attorney, which would be deemed privilege in an attorney-client relationship about potential litigation, legal advice, the executive session is required to protect attorney-client privilege and the public interest. Uh, we will, motion is to start that executive session at 11.45 and to meet back in the chambers uh, at 12.15. There a second. Did I get on my time right? Yeah. Okay. That's the motion. Second. Motion is seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk, roll up in a roll. Members will cast their vote. Have received 78 votes. That motion has passed. We will meet in the boardroom in about 15 minutes for the executive session. Thank you.